Hi everyone, my name is Erin and I'm here to talk to you today about creating a multilinguistic data set to investigate semantic priming. This project is in partnership with the Psychological Science Accelerator. The PSA is a CERN for psychological science. It is a globally distributed network of researchers with more than a thousand researchers in 82 countries that help collect data, translate, and more on democratically selected projects. It holds to open science principles and practices. And specifically today, I'm here to talk to you about one of those projects, which is the Semantic Priming Project Across Many Languages, or the SPAM-L. Now, semantic priming has a rich history in cognitive psychology. And very briefly, it's when a response latency is facilitated or faster for related word pairs versus unrelated word pairs. So you're much faster at reading dog cat than you are dog spoon. And that's usually measured with a lexical decision task, is this a word, or a naming task by reading aloud. Now the Semantic Priming Project by Keith Hutchinson et al provided us some starting priming values for 661 English word pairs. There's two sets of word pairs in that data set. Um, and it provides us a good starting point for understanding semantic priming. Now, once we start to think about other data sets that we might be interested in, because how do we predict priming, right? Well, we need other data. Well, what about other languages, right? So it, semantic priming project is only in English. There has been a recent increase in the publication of linguistic norms and the availability of those norms. So my graphic here I have on the right shows that the publishing of, of data sets like this has um, increased, increased exponentially over time. But once we start to combine those data sets together, so let's say I want to investigate English and Spanish and German, doesn't exist. And so while there are many data sets and there are many data sets in many languages, which is really great, once we start to st try to piece them together to computationally answer questions or simply control our stimuli in other studies, there are a lot of holes. So um, multilinguistic overlap is poor. So the goals of the SPAM-L project are threefold to create an online data collection portal that's modeled after the success of the Small World of Words project so that anyone can collect data anywhere, to produce a large multilinguistic semantic priming data set complete with other variables you might be interested in, like age of acquisition, familiarity, concreteness, or imageability, and to do this in up to 44 different languages, which I'm gonna talk to you today about and then provide a computational package so researchers can use and explore these data sets modeled after the great work by Jack Taylor in LexOps. So you can learn more by watching a video where I presented the beginning of this project. You are also interested in having people join us. This is a mega study with many labs. So you can email this email <clears throat> to get started on data collection, joining us for data collection, translation, and more. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about the stimuli that we're selecting for this project. How do you create stimuli for a priming study? Well, this also has a rich history. Originally, this was done by thinking about similarity, right? Similarity is just a shared meaning between two concepts. So we could define this at face value. Dog cat is clearly more related than dog spoon, although they might be both be something you find in a house. Then after a little while, we thought, well, this isn't totally replicable because um, these were just words that were used because they worked. So maybe we can define this as the number of shared features using feature production norms. Right? And feature production norms are simply what makes a zebra a zebra? Stripes. And then you compare how many features two words have in common. We could also use association strength by using the free association norms, which is the probability of one word eliciting another. Or last and more popular now, we can think about co-occurrence in many different ways, but computationally modeling this using large text corpora, which is what we're doing in this study. All right, so where do we get a lot of data, text data in many languages that we can use to calculate similarity to create our semantic priming um, conditions? Well, the open subtitles corpus is a large corpus of subtitles in 50 plus languages that is freely available. 
why subtitles? Well, subtitles have been shown to be critically useful in cognitive studies, especially predicting anything to do with linguistics. I always tell my students, if you don't know the answer, it's word frequency. <laughs> and so these have provided us really great estimates of word frequency, especially the way that we use the language rather than more sort of academic use of language. <clears throat> so a whole bunch of research on this. And also the corpora's are there. So they're free, they're large, and you can use them for many different types of projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so we took those, sort of. What we really did was we said, okay, we want nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs in our study. These are the meaning making words in a sentence. So we're not gonna use prepositions and the sort of filler words that hold up a sentence. So with those corpora, I need to be able to know which ones are the nouns, adverbs, and adverbs. And so that means that we need part of speech tagging. This has come a long way. There's a really great package called UD Pipe in R that will provide you part of speech tagging and more in many languages. So I've just provided an example here of the output, uh, a simplified version of the output that UD Pipe provides. And I can easily grab now the nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and verbs from a, um, from a corpus set. So what we did was we took every language from the open subtitles project that had an available UD pipe model. So we went from about 50 or 60 to 44 different possible models, which is still a lot. And we thought, and we looked at the corpus size. So not all corpora are created equal. English is the largest data set available. And there are data sets and languages that we'd really like to learn about like Africans that aren't quite large enough to provide us reliable and good sets of numbers. So what we did was we added the Wikipedia dump or data set to those just to have enough coverage of the language. So we would know which words were the most frequent and you know have more options for words. Now, generally we didn't wanna use the Wikipedia corpora if we had to, because those are not as naturalistic as the subtitle corpora. But we had to do this for five languages, which I, I think is justifiable so we don't lose languages that are really interesting, like Afrikaans, Hindi, um, and Urdu. Then we took out all the stop words and the numbers from the data set. And these are numbers that are written as numbers. So the word three is written out, it's left in. And then all uh, words that were less than three characters. Great. So now we have all these potential words and we processed them with UD pipe, selected out the nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. And then using the word frequency from the subtitle corpora, we took the top 10,000 words in each language. And these are all done separately because one issue with this research is its English centric focus. So we didn't wanna just select words in English and then translate because then we would be studying English priming in other languages. And we wanna know priming across languages. So we did this separately for every language. Overall, 44 languages included in total. Great, now we have all these words. What words should they be paired with? So these are basically our keywords. How do we get the target words? Well, for this, we took fast text models. Fast text is very similar to word to vec and it's a type of vector space model that creates a high dimension um, representation of our corpora, okay? And we did that for the language subtitles or, uh, and or the Wikipedia combination with the subtitles when necessary. And we actually borrowed this from subs to vec because they've already done it. And this is a project that um, has calculated fast text models for all the languages in the open subtitles project. That model in particular, if you're interested, is 300 dimensions with a five count window size. And a separate ongoing project is sort of thinking about, is that appropriate to use the same window size and dimensionality for all languages? But this is where we started, because I don't think the similarity will be too different across these, across these different representations in high vector space. <clears throat> then we took cosine for all of our top 10,000 words and grabbed the top five words related to each of those keywords to have a good set to start working with. 
Now, cosine, if you're not familiar, is a distance measure of similarity, very similar to correlation. That simply says these two word vectors are very similar. Zero means no overlap. One means perfect overlap. And like I said, we got the top five for each one. So we have about 50,000 pairs now to work with that are highly related. All right, great. Here's the problem. Cross-referencing is difficult. So we use translation to convert each language's back, each language stimuli back to English because literally researchers speak English and that was easiest, which may have some errors in it, but it's a good place for us to start. What we did was then merge all those data sets together to create this giant data set of all of the possible stimuli combinations in those languages. So we basically are trying to see how much overlap there is between all of these in the most frequent words that have the same, um, uh, Q target pairs. Okay? They don't have to have the same cosine, just the same pairs. So that's about 1.2 million different combinations um, once we start to account for the fact that they don't overlap. And sometimes translation is tricky because it creates um, phrases when you go from things like Japanese to English. Right? Um, and about an average overlap across languages of 3%. So that should tell you something right there. It ranges from about 2.7% to, which means it's in like two languages, to 70%. So we're really getting a good view here on what kinds of similarity is, is universal across languages. Okay. So that's sorted by language overlapped for our final selection of words. And we picked a thousand pairs based on a couple of rules. First, each word is only used once. This makes this very tricky because a lot of overlapping pairs um, in the, the higher overlap categories um, are the same, like cat dog. Right? Words are not different forms of each other. So you don't use run and running because we want to study semantic priming, not like lemma types of, of questions, right? So we want these to be different words and not um, phonetically similar um, or orthographically similar. And we're limiting the use of proper names. A lot of country names in here and a lot of, of subtitle related things. So very popular <laughs> movies come up a lot. <clears throat> All right, the overlap between languages, even when we try to pick the ones that are in the most data sets is still difficult. So the mean overlap for any of those stimuli words is about 28%. And this histogram at the bottom is a representation of how many languages a selected word pair is, is in, as in the top 10,000 words. Okay. And the average words that we're going to need to translate from one language to another is about 710. Now that's across both the Q and the target. So there are actually 2,000 words here. And so some final thoughts on creating such a complex data set to start a study. Multilinguistic research is often only done in a few select languages. So doing something across this many languages is um, not usual. Even with the advances in publishing of data sets, this sort of cross-referencing is still fairly difficult, right? There are a lot of holes. However, by focusing on the data that's available and letting the data drive our decisions, we can be guided by the language itself rather than selecting the words and simply translating. Because I wanna understand you know, these linguistic features across language, not in English translated into another language. So this really allows us to think culturally across many cultures. You can join the project. We would love for you to join the project. Please email me, right? So data collection and translations labs are still needed. We're just getting started. All right, any questions for me today? Thank you for listening. You can check out all this code on our GitHub website and all of the PSA collaborators who helped me make it this far are listed online with their author information. Thanks.